Um, one of the concepts that you use, um, uh, do you still find this useful, this whole notion of the Cartesian theater? You still talk about it? Still people ask you about <laughs> well, it? Well, yeah, I still find it useful to, to warn people about the mistake of the Cartesian theater. Um, it's, it's really a very seductive idea. Uh, uh, the light comes in our eyes. The sound waves come in our ears. We touch things. All these nerve signals start heading up, heading up, heading up, and there's processing, processing, processing. And, but of course, that's all in the medium of spike trains and neurons. And then what happens? Well, they get analyzed and analyzed and analyzed. And then what happens? Well, and then consciousness happens. Where? Well, somewhere right in the middle there. It's got to be a sort of summit to this mountain. This, the, the, where, where, where the input finally arrives at the place where the input's supposed to go. That's the Cartesian theater. That's a mistake. The idea that there is a privileged place in the brain where everything comes together for consciousness is a tremendously appealing idea, but it can be resisted, and it should. Now, when, when people ask me about this, they say, wait a minute, is this an empirical point or is this a conceptual point? Well, it's both. Um, first is the empirical point, and that is when we look inside, we find there isn't any such place. But we might have looked inside and found there was such a place, easy enough to imagine. In fact, there's a famous film clip, which is a beautiful example of this, and that's in Men in Black. It's in the <laughs> morgue when they slide out the, the corpse and, and Will Smith touches the little point on the guy's ear and his face opens up and there's a little guy sitting in the control room and he's looking at the screens and pushing the buttons. That's the Cartesian theater. So it's perfectly coherent. We might have found that and we looked inside, but you know, we didn't. So that's the empirical point. That's not what we found. The, the, the conceptual point is, if we had found that, then of course we'd have to look in the little green man's head, and at some point we've got to realize it's not Cartesian theaters all the way down, so at some point you have to take all the work that you're imagining the little guy in there to do, and you've got to distribute it around in space and time in the brain, and recognize that that's what consciousness is, it's that work getting done, and once it's done, it doesn't have to be done again in this little privileged theater. And so consciousness is smeared spatially and temporally. Because it's smeared spatially, it has to be smeared temporally. Otherwise, we'd have some kind of magic, which we don't need. And there's a notional sense of simultaneity, which is more important than the actual timing of events in the brain. Do you think it's a prerequisite of getting across any of these ideas about religion that people, that there be more general acceptance and understanding of how minds work or how brains work? That yeah, well, it's I, the I, neuroscience I, yeah, I think, I think so. Um, uh, some years ago, uh, there's a lovely philosopher of science and journalist in Italy named Giulio Torello. And he did an interview with me, and the, the headline, I don't know if he wrote it or not, the headline in, in uh, Corriere della Sera, when it was published, was, Si, abbiamo un'anima, ma hai fatto di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. And I thought, exactly, that's the view. Yes, we have a soul. In what sense? In the sense that our brains, unlike the brains even of dogs and cats and chimpanzees and dolphins, our brains have functional structures that give our brains powers that no other brains have, powers of look ahead primarily. We can understand our position in the world. We can see the future. We can understand where we came from. We know, we know what, what, we're, what we're here. You know, no, no buffalo knows it's a buffalo, but we jolly well know that we're members of Homo sapiens. And it's the knowledge that we have and the can-do, our capacity to think ahead and to reflect and to evaluate and to evaluate our evaluations and evaluate the grounds for our evaluations. It's this expandable capacity to represent reasons that we have 
that gives us a soul. But it's, what's it made of? It's made of neurons. It's made of lots of tiny robots. And we can actually explain the structure and operation of that kind of soul, whereas an eternal, immortal, immaterial soul is, is just a metaphysical rug under which you sweep your embarrassment for not having any explanation.